FOMO. My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I'm a FOMO Sapiens. And since you're here, I'm going to bet that you are too. And when you're like us and Monday comes around, you don't dread the new week. No, you wake up every Monday morning knowing that this week might just be the best one yet. This is Faux Monday, the snackable show that starts your week right with hot takes, life hacks, listener mail, and even some FOMO therapy. Hello, everybody. This is Faux Monday, the companion to FOMO Sapiens. We will have a new episode of FOMO Sapiens on Thursday. And this is our month of bold thinkers. And we have a really bold thinker. I will tell you about him in a minute. But until then, happy Faux Monday, best day of the week. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night. And of course, FOMO Sapiens 24-7. Now, my guest on Thursday is the great... Khaled Kataili. Now, Khaled is the CEO of a company called Legacy, and he's got a fascinating life story. He grew up in the Middle East, moved to Canada. He started this business after a traumatic experience. Now, what the business does, which is you're going to get used to hearing the word sperm a lot on Thursday. Let's just get it out there. The business is focused on male reproductive health. It helps men to bank their sperm. And Khaled has, in this process of telling the story about the business, he's raised over $40 million. And I got to tell you, I met him randomly, actually. Uh, Somehow or another, he found me and asked me to come on this podcast that he started for his business, which, by the way, he never released it. So I guess that's still in the vault. But we hit it off, and I realized, like, he is a natural salesperson. This guy could sell ice to an Eskimo. But more than that, he has taken that natural skill and he's combined it with a lot of hard work to become a really effective fundraiser. And what's great about all of this, and we talk about this in the episode, is you know, there are, this is not something that you can't learn. You can learn. Yeah, having the natural skills is helpful, but he talks about fundraising in depth. And I just want to get into that today because having followed Hollywood's story and also having watched a lot of other great CEOs fundraise, some of which don't have that charisma per se. It's been interesting to learn the lessons of what it takes to fundraise effectively. And a little bit more on Khaled's fundraising, not only did he raise from great investors like First Mark, which is a fund here in New York City, he got some celebs. He got The weekend. He got Justin Bieber. I mean, he's got the Biebs on his cap table, which is insane. And so we will talk about that as well on Thursday. But again, it gets back to this point of, can you figure out how to fundraise and tell a story? And that's really the point. Fundraising is telling a story. And if you can't tell the story of your business and why it matters, it's a lot harder to raise money. And it's also really hard to raise money when you're just cold calling people. We've talked about this in the past, but like LinkedIn, I get all these messages on LinkedIn from people asking me to invest in their company, which it's nice of them to send that message, but I really am sort of like, who are you? And you send me a little blurb and there's no story there. So it's just not an effective way. I've actually asked people when I get those notes, I write back and I say, I'm just curious, does this work? And generally, I don't think it does. There's a difference between, you know, going up to somebody at a conference and getting to know them a bit and then starting that cold call. But cold calling on LinkedIn to raise money for your business, if you're doing it, stop right now and do the things we're about to talk about after the break. FOMO. FOMO. Okay, everybody. The first thing you got to do when you're fundraising is be able to show people that there is a fit between the founder and the product, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about this in great detail on next week's Full Monday, so I'm not gonna belabor the point here. But with Khaled, what's interesting is, you know, he didn't come from the industry. It's not like he was a doctor for reproductive health, but he was able to come up with a sense of experience and a sense of knowing the industry and having studied the industry that he could convey to investors. And so he was able to then convince people that he had the right team around him and the right approach to build the business. And so this is super important. And again, we'll talk about it in a couple of weeks because sometimes you say, well, you know, Patrick, listen, I'm not an expert in this particular industry. How do I overcome that? And there are ways to do it. 
but you got to at least have a plan because nobody wants to invest in a CEO or a founder who doesn't understand their industry. I remember a couple of years ago, I met with this company. I won't say who it is, but they were in a particular uh, consumer product space. Like, let's just say this isn't real, but let's just say they were doing sodas. And I started asking them really basic questions because to be honest, I don't know a lot about that industry. So I was just saying like, oh, what do you think about Coca-Cola's new product line? And they didn't know anything about it. And so I thought to myself, this is basic stuff that you should have at least read up on when you're meeting with investors. So that's the stuff. Even if you are not coming from Coca-Cola and launching this new beverage company, have you done the homework? Have you gotten experts around you? Do you have people on your advisory board that can convince investors that you can figure it out and that you've been spending time figuring out what's going on in the industry? Number two, have a pitch that resonates emotionally. And this is the storytelling part. I mean, it's really interesting. You'll hear the story of how Holland got his business started, but it came out of an accident that happened to him where he thought he might not be able to have a child. And so therefore he realized, okay, I'm gonna check out what it means to go to a sperm bank. And it was terrible and he had a bad experience and he thought this is an opportunity to change the game. I'm gonna come up with something better. And he tells that story. I've heard him tell that story in public settings. I once went to a dinner that he told a bunch of journalists that story. And people, they, they were looking at him with rapt attention because it was so relatable. And so having a pitch that says, this is why this matters to me. Here's why I quit my job and started this company and I'm spending 18 hours a day working on this. Yeah, it, obviously you gotta have the economic sort of argument that this is a cool space in terms of the opportunity to generate capital and generate returns and generate opportunity. But I also am invested in it emotionally because investors wanna know that you're all in. And when you have a story, that can convince them that you are emotionally invested in this business, it can have tremendous power, shockingly strong power. Because people don't tell when, they, when they're when they talking to people about the, the investment they made. They're not talking about, oh, well, you know, what's great about this business is that he has four facilities and each one has a profit margin of X, Y, Z. No, they may say that, but what they'll focus on is, did you know the way he came up with this idea was this happened and that happened and it's very memorable, right? So that has power. Now, that being said, <laughs> that's great. And it definitely will set you apart from the pack. But number three, you gotta have the business plan. You gotta have the numbers, the details. You gotta have the budget, you know, the projections, all those things. Savvy investors will have expected that you would have done your homework, right? And so it is always shocking to me, and it doesn't happen that often, thankfully, but it's shocking to me when you see a pitch and there's no detail. It looks like, uh, it kind of looks like an Apple commercial. It's like blank space. And you're sort of like, well, have you thought about how much this would cost or that would cost or hiring or just basic stuff? And they don't have the answers. And it's sort of like, if you expect to raise several hundred thousand dollars or several million dollars and you aren't able to share that kind of information, you know, that's dangerous. Like that's Elizabeth Holmes level things that we don't want to take part in. And so, you know, Elizabeth Holmes had the emotional pitch. She had all that, but she didn't have the business plan with the numbers. It was all made up. And so that, uh, you know, any investor worth their salt should be checking on that. And if they're not, then, you know, it could be bad. It could be people who don't know what they're doing and, and you got to provide it. So I would say at a minimum, you need to have you know, a detailed budget. You need to have assumptions that have been tested in the market. Really give people the nitty gritty on what you plan to do. FOMO. FOMO. All right. Number four, you know what really helps in a fundraising? Momentum. The big mo. If you can show people that you signed a client that you've opened a facility, like the more evidence that you have that, okay, you are actually making progress on executing on your vision for this business, the more likely you are going to have a successful fundraise. And that's why a lot of founders, by the way, you know, they send out updates to all potential investors when something good happens to say, hey, guess what? We just closed this deal or, hey, you know what? We just made this big hire. Those kinds of things, momentum, you know what they generate? They generate FOMO right? Because people are like, wow, this train is leaving the station and I want to be on it. And so that is really important. Number five, this one also super important, clever segmentation of investors. And I, and I learned this 
in my career in private equity, when we were trying to raise funds, my boss would always say, we have three types of potential investors, the A's, the B's, and the C's. The A's are the ones we really, really want. The B's are the ones that we'd be very happy to have. The C's, eh, you know, they're not all that great. Go to the C's first. Why? To practice your pitch and to make sure that it's reasonably good before you go to the A's and the B's. Because the C's are going to ask you lots of questions. They're going to spend time with you. You're going to realize, oh my goodness, slide number seven doesn't work. Or, oh, that, that question they asked me, well, I had no idea how to answer it. And so you sort of get all of the nerves out. You get all of the bad answers out. You get all of the bad slides out. You sort of just do your dress rehearsals before you open up on opening night with the A's and the B's. And so it's a wonderful way to go. And also when you think about investors, it's really hard because you know all money is not the same, right? Some investors really understand your industry, some don't. So look at companies that are in your space and see which investors or funds have invested in them and who are the partners who've invested in them and then engage with those people. Now, not direct competitors, obviously. You don't want to do that. But say you're looking at like Holid Reproductive Health. Well, as somebody had invested in a female reproductive health company, start there. Go to that partner. It's more about the partner than the firm, really. I mean, you can have a great name for the firm, but if the partner is not interested in your business and doesn't get it, how can they add value? So you want to think about it that way. That's how you segment the investors. Number six, be tireless. I mean, this takes months and will take dozens, if not hundreds of meetings. I, I remember Holly told me at the end of his fundraising, we had a lunch and the poor guy looked like he had been through some sort of uh, small, uh, I don't even know, like just a little war. He looked tired and, and beat up. Now he looks nice and rested, but it is true when he told me, I could understand because he had had so many meetings to get to the point where he raised that money. And it was all over Zoom and tiring and, you know, it's endless and they always want more from you. So just recognize that you need to be tireless in order to succeed. And finally, number seven, anticipate your needs and raise in advance because you never know when the market was going to crash. And frankly, these days, it's messy out there. And so the companies that raised money in advance and have lots of runway, you know, 12 to 18 months of runway are so well positioned. The ones with less than six months, we don't even know if they're going to be around anymore. So you got to you gotta plan. All right, everybody. Those are my seven pieces of advice. Just to recap, have a strong team product fit, founder product fit. Number two, emotional pitch required. Have that story down. Number three, have a good business plan. Four, generate momentum. Five, segment those investors. Six, be tireless. And seven, anticipate your needs and fundraise in advance. All right. I'm sure you have your own opinion on this. You might even disagree with me. And you know, disagreement is welcome. So reach out to me at let's connect at patrickmcginnis.com, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, or on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, and tell me what you think. I'm going to be back with Holland on Thursday. But until then, take care of yourselves, FOMO sapiens. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO. Want more FOMO Sapiens and FOMO Monday? Head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis and on Twitter at PJ McGinnis. 